Today's guest is Mark Atkinson. This is a very different episode, but it's a very important one. It runs a little longer, but I promise you, if you stick with it, you will be rewarded with a perspective on global business and business between the U.S. and China that you didn't have before this. I'm telling you, it is a treat, and we're fortunate enough to have Mark share a large degree of his journey. And even though he shared all that, there's still so much more to see in his book. But as somebody who was the beneficiary of having had a chance to hear his story, and connected to some of the current events in the world. I mean, we're talking someone who saw emerging technologies in China at a time when it wasn't really built out yet for the automotive and then the cellular and what that led to with EVs, all those technologies. And we get a chance to hear it straight from an entrepreneur who was right there in the factory floors every step of the way. Even moving his family back and forth and how that stepped into the, the aviation and, and, and uh, finance air industry. There's so much to unpack in this and so much to learn from as an entrepreneur, as a business owner. And I hope that you walk away with this uh, from this episode. I really hope you walk away from this episode with a newfound perspective and appreciation for global business and how important it's going to be as technologies like AI come into the fray. So. I won't belabor the point anymore. Without further ado, here's Mark. So, so let me give you, uh, you know, just a quick background on the book. So, uh, the book is uh, "Risky Business in Rising China," and then it's you know deals or deals and lessons learned as an American entrepreneur and a surging superpower grappling with growing pain. So, I have to apologize for the alliteration, <laughs> but. Um, you know, I, I, I think uh, really what I tried to do, Phil, is I tried to inform and entertain. Um, I want to make a comment about the Chinese characters on the front of the book. Uh, so there, there is an explanation uh, several pages in. But so the Chinese characters in Chinese say, and what that means literally is risky business. But, you know, there are many nuanced meanings of, you know, a four-character Chinese saying. It can also mean dare to take risks. And that's, you know, one of the things that I want to leave people with in this story is that, as you said, somebody's stealing your product and driving it away and, and you're losing all this money. The sky is falling. But, you know, it, it, everything worked out. And, and, you know, if I look back on the time that I spent in China, you know, maybe at certain moments in time, I was like, wow, this is, you know, this is disastrous or this is not working. But overall, it was really worth it to, you know, to dive in and to do those different things. I'd really love to ask you, first of all, how did you get involved in business in China, if you if you could just a bit give us a little primer about your story and your connection to China. Yeah, I, you know, and Phil, I often get that question: is to, you know why China? Uh, and uh, the answer goes back a ways. Uh, I have a family connection where my grandfather and my father were in Asia even before World War II. My grandfather was in the U.S. Navy. Uh, and was actually based in the Philippines. And in the summertime, you know, they would cruise to China. And of course, in those days, in the 1930s, China was occupied by uh, the Japanese military. So it was, you know, chaotic, uh, crazy, um, very rough place. And my father, as a 12-year-old boy, would go and uh, stay in China in the summer of 1938-39. And you know, I think from that, he came out of that with some very deep impressions about, you know, Asia and what was going on. And then, you know, of course, after the war, uh, you know, there was a, a big question as to, uh, you know, what was the future in, in Asia? And my father always felt that there was a lot of growth opportunity uh, in China, in Japan, you know, all across Asia. And uh, Phil, I come from a big family. I come from a family with eight kids. Um so, you know, my father, in encouraging us to pursue opportunities in Asia, my older sibling ended up studying Japanese. So, as you can imagine, I couldn't do that. You know, I had to basically find something different. So, I ended up studying Chinese, and our family took a trip to China in 1982. 
and, you know, put yourself in the shoes of like a college freshman, a 19 year old in 1982. And we went in the winter time and it was cold and we were on this Pan Am 747 and it was like only about 20% full and it was dark. You know, we arrived at Beijing airport. It was murky. There were soldiers outside with, you know, padded overcoats and fur hats and AK-47s. And it was like, you know, it was like something that Hollywood created of North Korea. <laughs> right. So, you know, it, uh, when I first arrived there, you know, my impression was that, uh, you know, things were a little bit run down. You know, we went to the Forbidden City. We went to the Great Wall. We did all the classic, you know, tourist sites. Uh, but, you know, coming out of China in 82, uh, as a kid, you know, I felt that it was sort of backward, you know, it was desperately poor. Uh, people were wearing, you know, green and blue mouse suits and they were riding, you know, little black bicycles. But at that time, what was apparent was that, you know, the media was starting to report that Fortune 500 U.S. companies were beginning to go to China. China was beginning to open up. And, you know, what I, what I had a feeling for, but didn't recognize at that time was that, you know, China was about to embark on one of the biggest transformations of our lifetime. And, you know, what is the result of that is that they lifted 800 million Chinese people out of poverty. And, you know, so just to put that in perspective, I mean, that's a bigger event in our lifetime for humanity then, you know, like, the you know, the Berlin Wall coming down and the fall of communism in Eastern Europe and Russia. So uh, China was just embarking at the very beginning of that. Um, and as a kid, I, I also had, you know, wanderlust. I was like, okay, I'm graduating from college. I was an electrical engineer. Do I really want to go to AT&T? You know, if it's like AT&T right. <laughs> <laughs> or disappear into China, I think I want to do China. And, you know, as a young kid, you know, young kids, basically, we don't have any commitments or anything. And so, you know, off I went. And, um, you know, a lot of trepidation in the early years. uh, I, uh, I, well, let me just uh, comment on um, my first job. I got a job with a machine tool company out of Ohio. um, And I didn't know the first thing about machine tools. Uh, you know, machine tools are basically used for cutting, grinding, you know, uh, shaping metal. Uh, and they're fundamental to, you know, so much of industry from the automotive industry to aerospace. So I found the guys in Ohio very down to earth. Uh, and they offered to send me straight into China. And that's really what I wanted. Wow. Uh, so I ended up going there. And I described this in the second chapter in my book about, you know, trading know-how that uh, went into China and coordinated the transfer of technology for one of our uh, computer-controlled machines to a Chinese company. And you know, it's funny, Phil. When I first arrived there, here I was, like a you know, 23-year-old kid, looking very young, uh, more hair than I have today. And I, I was really fearful. I was like, I was like, you know, how am I going to be received by these Chinese business people? when they look at my youth and and experience, you know, particularly in Asia and in the end it worked out. It was, it was great. Uh, My Chinese, you know, was at a very low level at that time, but I was able to communicate. And, you know, one of the interesting things about working in China in the early years was that, you know, China technologically was pretty backward. So, you know, no phones, uh, you know, no fax machines, um, no distractions. Uh, and so as a young person working in China, you had a lot of time on your hands to, you know, to meet Chinese individuals, to get to know them, you know, to learn about their lives and their aspirations, uh, to take time in the city parks, you know, to see the old people dancing, you know, playing the arhu. Um, and, and, and so I would say doing business in the early days in the 1980s was, was very pleasant. It was, uh, it was also a little bit of an Indiana Jones experience. Um, and, I, and I say that because when you went, you know, for business travel, you didn't fly in airplanes. You, for the most part, you know, you took train travel and, you know, a typical train trip would be 10 hours on a very slow moving train. Um, and if you took a black and white photo, you know, these were steam engine pulled trains. So it was like being in, out in the American West. 
so I so I had a great time. But you know, as a kid, uh, I uh, my experiences in those first years of doing business in China was um, working with Chinese people who I was the first American that they ever met, and. One of the funnier ones was I chaperoned a group of these guys to Ohio, to Cincinnati, to do some training. And I lived together with them in their motel. And, you know, the first thing they did when they got to the motel room is they would hold the telephone up next to their ear and pretend like they were in deeply in conversation because <laughs> they'd never had a phone before. <laughs> oh, wow. And, you know, then there was another one where they, they, uh, they really liked to... Uh, learn how to drive so we had a you know we rented a chevy van and then I, I i would have them drive the chevy van around in the parking lot um so it, it, you know we had a lot of fun times uh and and, and again it was a it, it was a period of time where they were just opening up uh they were just learning about the rest of the world uh and you know then you know boy did you know things change over time and then uh, subsequent to that, you know, I have to admit that as a young person, I was swayed briefly. Uh, Donna and I were talking about this yesterday, that um, Japan was killing it at the end of the 80s. And, you know, yeah. people really felt and the media was really pushing this message that Japan was going to take over the world. And, you know, you could see it in America with, you know, Toyotas and Hondas and Nissans and you know, Toshiba and Sony TVs. Um, so I took time out from China and I went to Tokyo. And uh, that was really at the peak of the Japanese bubble. And what I mean by that was that when I worked at Sony, my Sony colleagues were very cocky and almost arrogant about how, you know, this concept of Japan Inc. was really killing and eating our lunch. And the head of Sony wrote a book, uh, Akio Morita wrote a book called The Japan That Can Say No. And, you know, when it was translated into English and shown to congressional leaders, business leaders in America, you know, people were shocked because the Japanese guys were saying, hey, these Americans, you know, are tripping up over themselves and they're not very good at what they do. And, you know, we can, we can really take over. And, and I'm bringing this up only because I think sometimes the media looks at China today and they go, oh my God, you know, China's taking over. You know, they control the EV market or they control the battery market. And, and um, I think given the experience I had with Japan, I'm, I'm, I'm less concerned than, than maybe the mainstream media. But eventually I did find my way back to China. Uh, and uh, honestly, what happened was I took time out in graduate school. I went to MIT and got a dual degree in uh, business and engineering. And the first day that I was at MIT, Phil, the New York Times cover story was, you know, the Tiananmen Square massacre. Yeah. And here I was, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd studied Chinese. I'd, I'd invested myself in it you know, still young and, and options available. But, you know, I looked at that and I said to myself, oh my gosh, you know, China has gone into the penalty box and, you know, maybe my investment in this is not going to go anywhere. Um, I did, uh, the best thing, by the way, I came out of business school was I found my wife, uh, Shannon Atkinson, um, and she led me to Europe. And so I spent, uh, you know, another uh, couple of years uh, working in Europe and, uh, in that era, uh, there was also concern not only about Japan Inc., but there was concern about something called Fortress Europe, you know, that Europe was going to integrate and they were going to unify their market and their currency, and they were not going to let anybody else in. And, and so we Americans, you know, were sort of concerned about that. And we figured, you know, we got to have, you know, a physical presence there. I did that, but what I discovered was that Europe is actually pretty fragmented in terms of linguistically. Culturally, uh, you know, the Italians and the Germans and the French and the Spanish don't necessarily get along real well with each other. So in the end, uh, China came back on the radar screen as all of a sudden China had pulled out of the Tiananmen Square period and all of a sudden was just, you know, the gold rush was on. And, and so Shannon and I decided to go to China in 1994. Um, and, you know, the book I then covers not only that from 1994 to 2015. So we did 21 years as a couple there. Wow. Um, and when I went back, uh, 
I, I, the first thing I did is I went into a business where uh, I represented a U.S. aircraft engine manufacturer. And the challenge we were dealing with is that Air China, you know, the flag carrier of uh, China's commercial aircraft fleet, was basically not doing the maintenance on their equipment. Um, you know, and this was, you know, still early days for China. And so the guys running the airline probably thought that, well, you know, this is Western equipment. It should operate. It should need to change the oil or, you know, kick the tires. <laughs> and so we had this big problem as a, you know, an OEM providing, uh, you know, hardware to the airline that if they didn't do the maintenance, we were going to get blamed for all the problems. So uh, I had a, uh, I brought in a SWAT team of U.S. mechanics, and at nighttime, you know, we had this situation where they would pull these 747s into these freezing cold hangars at Beijing Airport, and our guys would work together with the Chinese mechanics to, you know, fix things and, you know, change uh, various parts and whatnot. And then, you know, the next morning I would go out and I would stand in the cockpit of the 747 with uh, the Chinese pilots and they would crank the engines up to full blast to just test them for takeoff. They then pulled that airplane to the terminal and filled it with passengers. And the, the guys in the cockpit were looking at the oil gauges and it's like, the readings don't look right. There's something wrong here, but you know, whatever, uh, must be a problem with the gauge. They then subsequently, they took off and lo and behold, blew all the oil out of one of the engines. Um, and, you know, that's what's called an in-flight shutdown. You have to shut down the engine, otherwise you destroy it. So brought the plane back and, you know, big uh, hassle, you know, whose fault was it, you know, finger pointing. But so uh, that, you know, period in my life was governed by, I was trying to create a joint venture where our OEM company basically was going to take over the maintenance shop of the airline because they were doing such a terrible job. You know, we were going to try to take it over and, you know, got into all kinds of territorial disputes about it and everything. But at the same time, it had a, it was, China was still pretty wild. You know, this was pre nine 11. So, you know, there were days where I could drive my Beijing Jeep out onto the taxiways at Beijing airport and look in the <laughs> rearview mirror and see an airplane bearing down on me. <laughs> but anyway, so, uh, uh, you know, the end of that chapter, unfortunately, uh, Air China was like, we're not willing to give you control of our maintenance facilities. You know, you could, you could come and spend your money to fix our planes, but we're not going to give you control of the actual facility. So I then went down to, uh, uh, the chapter is called going down to the countryside. So there's this idea in China under Mao Zedong and, the, uh, and, you know, his era that he would take urban elites, you know, basically intellectuals. And he would send them out to farms in the countryside because he basically, one is he wanted to get them out of, you know, out of his hair. And the other is he wanted to teach them lessons about like, you know, you need to be more like the farmer and, you know, and suck it up and, and, and I learned from hard labor. So I went out to Sichuan. Sichuan's about a thousand miles away from Beijing. And so one of the funny thing, Bill, is, is that in a country like China, you know, which is as big as the United States, if you're far away from the central government, you, you know, the emperor is far away and the hills are high in between. And so the, you know, the local officials tend to sort of wing it and do things their own way, which in some ways actually makes doing business, you know, there much easier. That, you know, instead of being in Beijing or Shanghai or Guangzhou, you know, get out and, and, and go to some of the frontier provinces. So we built a factory. Uh, the general manager who I was working for, I was the ops manager at the time. He had some uh, pressing personal issue. He had to leave. So they immediately said, Mark, you're the guy on site. And, you know, this is a case where I want to highlight for your audience that, you know, when you're a young person and if you put yourself out in some geographical frontier, you know, Maybe it's Wyoming or Montana. <laughs> you know, no, but if you put yourself out in some geographical frontier, people will give you responsibility, partly because you're the only one willing to locate yourself there. And that's often a quick way 
to elevate yourself in terms of your knowledge and your skills, you know, by going, by being the person who's willing to be in that hardship location. So I ran a business. We, we built what's called the greenfield site. So it means, you know, basically starting from nothing. Uh, we built a, a, a big factory and uh, we put machines in it. And we hired the people. And, and just by the way, you know, so again, you know, you think about Japan and you think about its influence on the United States at that time. So we had all adopted the Toyota production system. And, you know, very simply, the Toyota production system is a very common sense way to run factories. A lot of, you know, visual management uh, techniques, a lot of, you know, Kanban approach to inventory management. So instead of using, you know, enterprise level software, Toyota production is a very common sense, almost like manual approach to how you run factories. And how do you keep everybody, you know, in the, on the process line, you know, up to speed. And it worked really well in China. And one of the things that the Chinese were surprised about was uh, Toyota production system also emphasizes, you know, self-reliance of factory workers. And so when you hire people, you know, what you care about when you're interviewing them is not necessarily their skill set or their math skills. What you care about is, you know, can they collaborate? Can they solve problems? Can they work together with others on their team? Um, And that really surprised our Chinese JV partners because, you know, in their world, you know, the boss knows everything. The factory workers do what they're told. And, you know, in terms of hiring people, it's just a matter of how do they score on a proficiency test. So that was a big change for them. And, you know, the good news, I would say, was that applying those Toyota type skills. And, you know, if you speak to anybody in the U.S. automotive industry today, they would be very familiar with that. But applying those skills, the Chinese responded really well particularly, you know, the younger Chinese really responded to that and really stepped up to take the responsibility for, you know, shutting down the line. There were quality issues and those types of things. So I did, uh, Phil, I did three years uh, building that factory. Uh, We produced a bunch of parts. We got FAA certified and we exported parts to the United States. And and then, you know, you're sitting out in the middle of nowhere and I had uh, two kids by then. And, you know, we were a little bit concerned about, you know, school options. And, uh, you know, honestly, you'll, you'll see in the book that uh, pollution was pretty bad uh, in, in Sichuan. Uh, so we were thinking, okay, let's try to get to back to Beijing. Uh, so I shopped around, you know, I went down to Hong Kong and I talked to different uh, headhunting firms. And lo and behold, I ended up with a firm called uh, Simco, which is Asian Strategic Investments, which what those guys had done is they had taken literally hundreds of millions of dollars of Wall Street money. And they had uh, basically acquired a pretty large portfolio of automotive parts businesses. And you know, the logic made sense is that if the Chinese automotive world is going to grow and in the automotive parts area, foreigners were allowed to take majority stakes, you know, rather than just being restricted to 50-50. So, These guys thought, okay, we buy up a bunch of these parts businesses, uh, you know, we're going to kill it. We're going to ride this wave of growth of automotive production in China. And, and, you know, certainly today you look at it in China, it's like the biggest producer of cars in the world today. So, you know, that would have played out. The problem was that instead of buying, you know, private sector companies, often they were buying operations that, you know, basically had been state run. And, you know, state-run businesses in China are notorious for, unfortunately, you know, high levels of corruption, uh, Mm. really bad incentives. Um, And so these poor guys got themselves into this portfolio where all of a sudden, you know, through people stealing, you know, parts out of the factory and reselling them and, and people taking kickbacks and bribes, all of a sudden, you know, the whole thing sort of started to sour. And so... They hired me to come in and turn around the big factory in Beijing, and we were in the uh, we were in the fuel injection business. So we made uh, you know diesel fuel injection systems, which were basically copies of Bosch products that you know got bolted onto diesel you know diesel engines. And we had a pretty decent business. You know we we 
we covered about 30% of, uh, you know, the market share for fuel injection, uh, Chinese mid-sized diesels. You know, but when I got there, I mean, the place was completely run down. Uh, it was old style manufacturing, you know, where it wasn't based on a uh, cellular manufacturing that the Japanese already were, you know, strongly promoting. And, you know, huge amounts of scrap, uh, really uh, big quality problems. Uh, and these guys were getting pushed out of the markets, you know, the high value markets like export. And then on top of that, I mean, you know, the, the, the chapter starts with, this is the chapter called Combating Corruption. The chapter starts with me having to fire one of the more notoriously corrupt guys who was the head of my export department. And what we had discovered was that he was basically driving vans into the factory and loading them up with our product that hadn't been, you know, laser stamped or anything. And then he would ship it down to Shenzhen in southern China and stamp it with, you know, Bosch from Germany and Zexel from <laughs> Japan. And then he would sell it for 100% profit in Malaysia and Thailand. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, just to show you how lucrative that was, this was, you know, we were selling these things at like 40% gross margin. So he was probably making millions of dollars of just pure return on that effort on, on stealing. Um, so I had to get rid of him. Uh, you know, he, he did everything he could to stick around, uh, you know, and he tried to take all his files with him and all his, you know, have all his henchmen basically stay in the loop. Um, and, you know, I remember there was one night I was at my, at home in my apartment with my family and he called me up and he's like, you can't do this to me, you know? And, and he wasn't threatening. Um, but but he was like you can't do this to me and you know you got to you got to you got to reverse this um, and so one of the interesting things about being an american working there was i was sort of like a martian and what i mean by that phil is that i didn't have any extended family in the city that he could go threaten whereas if i was a chinese guy he might say you know you better watch out because you know your brother or your, your sister or your children you know, might get into a car accident, and and no joke. Uh, um, you know, the, given the how high the stakes were financially, sure. Uh, you, you know, those types of things could happen. So I, you know, I did that for about two years, and then I, I honestly, I said to myself, and I, you know, this is probably similar to a lot of young people in the United States, but I said to myself, I said, okay, I've done manufacturing, and I can see very clearly that you know, young Chinese guys are really good at it. And then, you know, and they're going to take over. So I said, I, I, I really do need to make a career change. And this is a case of, you know, again, for your audience, something I really want to emphasize, which is this idea that not only do you take risks and you go to, you know, frontiers to do things, but reinventing yourself is really important. And, you know, sometimes reinventing yourself is you invest in a skill set, but other times you have to do it yourself. And what I mean by that is that here I was, I was coming out, I'd run factories. If I went to a venture capitalist uh, and said, hey, I want a job, they'd say, no, because you don't, you know, you don't, you have zero experience, you have no pedigree, you just absolutely don't know what you're doing. So I joined two other guys and this is the chapter, you know, leaping into risky ventures. And so what we did is we set up an investment fund that was focused on what's called the mobile internet. So, you know, a lot of Americans 20 years ago, their idea of mobile internet was like Wi-Fi connecting to your laptop at Starbucks, you know, because Steve Jobs hadn't invented the iPhone yet. But in China, 20 years ago, the mobile phone was already becoming a connection to the internet. And, you know, the mobile phone was becoming a source of entertainment, a source of payment. Um, you know, just to give you an idea, how would you do payments on a mobile phone 20 years ago? You use something called premium text messaging. So if you wanted to download a video or a song from a computer or even to your phone, you sent a text message to China Mobile. And that message would be priced at a much higher price than, than the average you know, text message. So you were basically paying for the text message as a way of buying that particular, you know, virtual product. So 
so again, you know, we set up this investment fund. We focus completely on seed stage. So we were investing in young Chinese entrepreneurs. Some of them had studied in America. Some of them had studied in Japan. Some of them had never left the country. But, you know, they all came to us with business models in many cases that had been proven in, you know, in countries outside of China. You know, so uh, Japan was a leader in entertainment downloads to the phone, you know, things like Java games and stuff like that. So NTT Docomo was a, you know, was a big proponent of that in Tokyo. And then like in Norway, you know, the Scandinavians were also doing a lot of, of stuff. Telenor was a real leader in, uh, in mobile internet of, you know, back in the Nokia uh, candy bar phone. Um, and how do you use texting to do all kinds of other business models? You know, the classic one, as you can, as you can imagine, is American Idol. And you get the audience to vote for, you know, the, wow, the, the yeah. songs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so, and, and we had one of those businesses. We, in fact, we had Norwegian guys uh, who came to China and um, we then localized their business model in, into China. So it was a lot of fun. And, and I learned a lot. You know, I went from being a, a factory guy to, you know, then being a venture guy uh, and, you know, learned along the way. Um, we had a portfolio of about 10 companies. Uh, like most venture capital, eight were strikeouts, you know, basically. Uh, bankrupt and done. Uh, one was a what I call a base hit. So the base hit, you know, basically got us a decent return on that one single investment. And then one was a home run. And this was a guy uh, who had uh, come back from Japan and had developed a Java, you know, a platform for downloading Java applications. You know, primarily things like games and, and other entertainment. He had developed a relationship to China Mobile, and so. We nurtured his business, and we ended up selling him to a U.S. listed company called uh, Glue Mobile. Uh, uh, but it took a long time. I mean, it, it was. It, I would say, Phil, venture capital can be scary because you know you you've got your own personal skin in the game. I, I wrote a fairly big check to help launch the whole thing, and then I sat for seven years waiting for you know something to pan out. Wow! Um, and, and then you know it did. Yeah, uh, but it took a long time. <laughs> and so in the meantime, I then joined uh, some uh, private entrepreneurs and there's a chapter called Chasing Pennies. And and so, you know, for the general audience, what, what does that really mean? So in, in, in the world of Chinese internet and Chinese entertainment, uh, the transaction value that Chinese consumers can spend on, you know, is way lower than what we have here in the United States. Um, do you remember when in America, when Apple first launched the, the music, it was like you pay a dollar per song? Song, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So that would never work in China. You know, it was like, so in China, a lot of the times you know, it's pennies per transaction. Um, and, and so the issue then with chasing pennies is, you know, you think about with such small transactions, you need to develop millions of customers. Uh, to get any type of scale in the business. And that was the issue, is how do you chase all of those customers? So I first I joined this uh, entrepreneur. I was, I, I was with a U.S. company out of Portland, Oregon, and we acquired a company in China that was doing you know, mobile payments with a mobile phone. And the biggest thing he had going at the time was he had a close relationship to Hunan Television, which was running... China's version of, you know, American Idol. And, you know, this is China. So compared to American Idol, many, many more people in the audience. I mean, literally 800 million votes for singers. You know, just think about that. <laughs> but, you know, pennies per vote. So, and so... This guy had cornered the relationship with Hunan TV. He himself was from Hunan province. He was sort of a, uh, a pirate uh, individual. And, you know, he was a great example of a Chinese entrepreneur who had grabbed an opportunity and was commercializing it. And that chapter starts with these beautiful, you know, singers uh, who come sauntering into our office uh, where he's hosting them. And everyone's like, oh, my God, you know, these are national icons. 
students here in our office. Uh, you know, so people, their, their minds are really blown by that. So uh, he made millions of dollars in profit for the Oregon company. But the problem, Phil, was that he ran into a situation where, you know, when you think about voting for singers at a national scale, it's a huge exercise in democracy. Yeah. And, and, and so that freaked out the Communist Party because they were like, oh my gosh, if people have the ability to text message, they can start voting about anything. You know, is the leader of the country a good person or not? You know, vote yes or no. <laughs> so, so guess what? You know, we got shut down. You know, that business uh, eventually got shut down. So we went from millions of dollars of uh, opportunity to basically nothing. So, you know, we kept branching out. And, and, you know, a Chinese entrepreneur has to stay one step ahead. Technologically, these guys knew they were really sharp. Um, there's a funny story in the book where I talk about, you know, the Beijing Olympics was in 2008. And so they ran this uh, online competition. They said, let's get some foreigners to participate in the torch marathon across the country. So I said, you know, foreigners can, you know, put your profile up and we'll have the people of China vote on whether you should participate or not. And, and so I told this guy, I told Xiao Jinping, the entrepreneur, I said, you know, by the way, I've got my hat in the ring on this one. And he's like, okay, tell me the details of that. You got all the details and everything. And lo and behold, I went from being like, at the bottom of the ranking to within two weeks, I was all of a sudden in the top 10. <laughs> it was like, Zhao, how did you do that? You know, the, the, that was clearly an internet manipulation. That had nothing to do with people, physical people actually voting. So, I mean, these guys were very sharp. And, and it, you know, again, they had to stay one step ahead. They had to be, you know, politically savvy. Uh, so we got into some other businesses. We got into online travel and, and you know, we did some stuff with the commuter card. And then uh, while I was doing that, a guy contacted me. This was a guy who, had, you know, ex Goldman Sachs, uh, who had done uh, really some major deals for Goldman Sachs in Asia, and, and he knew me because he he knew my brother, my younger brother, uh, from doing charter school stuff in the United States. So he called me up and he said, "Look, I got this deal. I'm sitting in L.A. and I'm sitting in an electric car in L.A. and this was 2008." Okay. And he's like, dude, you know, you got to join me because this is an opportunity to source low cost electric cars out of China. And so the, the, the vision was China is a large scale producer of lithium ion batteries. You know, they were already selling to Apple and, and you know, Korean uh, makers and, you know, Korea uh, and China is also a low cost producer of cars. So, you know, put two and two together and let's, let's make a cheap car that can compete at the price of like a Prius, you know, like $25,000. And, you know, great idea. At the same time, just by the way, you know, Elon Musk was launching the Roadster, which was selling for like over $100,000. And, and we thought we were pretty smart. We were like, oh my God, we're going to come in with like the Volkswagen, you know, Beetle of, of electric cars. And at the same time, Phil, you know, you'll, when you read that chapter, this is called Creating the People's EV. You'll see that I was really reluctant to go back into the manufacturing world. Like the last thing I wanted to do professionally was go back to like screwing around in a factory where nobody gets paid. You know, the quality is stinks. You know, all kinds of problems, <laughs> way, way more complicated and not a nice working environment. But uh, this guy Kevin Singer in LA, he goes, he goes, no, you really got to do this. And he sent me a Morgan Stanley report that. You know, it talked about the fact that the the era of the EV was coming, and and you know the power density was up there that lithium ion could do it, that the cost of you know lithium was coming down, and you know logically it made sense. And just so I don't know if you remember, but in two thousand eight, you know, with the financial crisis, uh, price per barrel of oil was like over a hundred dollars. You know, so uh, the price of oil looked like it was just going up and up and up. Uh, you know, so you were sort of like, well, the EV is just going to fall into this market opportunity. So I finally agreed. And, uh, you know, we kicked it off. And, and uh, the challenge initially was that what we were doing is we were sourcing low cost, uh, uh, low speed vehicles. So low speed vehicles have the benefit that they don't have to comply with the U.S. safety requirements. So as long as you, you know, as long as you limit 
the speed of the vehicle to like below 25 miles an hour. It's, it's basically a high end golf cart, you know? So, you know, you don't need seat belts, you don't need airbags, you don't need any of that stuff. Um, and, you know, then the U.S. basically says if the car comes to America, you can't drive it on a highway, you know, you can only drive it on like a residential road. So the, the, the company was first in that world and we were selling low speed vehicles to, uh, you know, to fleet buyers, you know, so basically parks and recreation. You know, the classic thing, <laughs> drive your rakes around in a, in, a, in a vehicle that can't go any faster than 25 miles an hour. But our vision was, you know, we wanted to graduate. We wanted to go to high speed. We wanted to go to a real car that could drive on the highway. And, uh, you know, it sounds really primitive. But in those days, the vision was that the car needed to go 100 miles. Okay, you know, a Tesla today could do like 300 miles. But so in those days, you know, the car needed to go 100 miles. And 80 miles an hour was good enough. You, you know, you didn't you, you, you didn't need to go super crazy above that. So we embarked on developing a highway speed car. And the first thing that we ran into was that China hadn't really bought into you know the EV future yet. And what we realized is that we couldn't find anybody in China to do the engineering work to give us you know that car. And so in LA. And all across America, we started finding young engineers who could innovate a drivetrain and a, a battery management system and a battery pack. And, you know, I don't know how long ago you interviewed, you know, Brock Tenhoten, yeah. but uh, he was one of the creators of that. And I can remember sitting in an office, you know, where Brock and the battery chief designer would just like play around with engineering ideas on the back of a paper napkin. And, and, you know, I look at it, they were basically geniuses. Uh, they, they were the alpha guys of creating, you know, this drivetrain technology and this battery management technology. And, you know, I would argue that what they created 15 years ago is basically state of the art in a Chevy Volt. It may not be a Tesla, but, you know, it's pretty damn good. So uh, we got ourselves, you know, we designed the car and then, you know, the challenge was how do you, how do you then convert all that and localize it in China so then you can take advantage of you know, China's low cost? And so we set up a, a JV to, to make lithium ion batteries. Um, and that, that actually went well. Uh, you know, we had to design everything ourselves because you know, it's a big step from a telephone battery or a laptop battery to actually go to the, you know, the cell format of a, um, of a car, you know, battery pack. But, you know, the, the battery side worked well and, and, and our interests were really well aligned with our JV partner there. On the car side, we stupidly outsourced the car production to a state-owned company. It was like a third-tier car producer in distant, you know, northeastern China and snowy northeastern China. And those guys were just bandits. I mean, they didn't, they didn't care whether we made a lot of cars or not. They were going to charge us for everything that we did with them. And, you know, you'd say to them, you'd say, look, hey, look, you know, our, our bread is buttered on the same side. You know, we make a lot of cars. You guys make a lot of money. And it just, you know, it never panned out. We, we, uh, and, and the chapter sort of details some of the craziness of that. Um, there's an interesting story. Uh, I'll raise it, uh, although it's it's probably somewhat controversial. So at one point, you know, when you develop a car for the United States, uh, what a lot of people don't realize with Tesla and some of the other EVs is that there are three things about car production that are really important. One is the technology of the drivetrain. And, you know, Tesla does that really well. But in addition to doing that, you also have to comply with the U.S. safety. And, and that's not trivial. That means that you have to have, you know, special metal alloys. You have to have special crumple designs in the front of the car. You know, you have to meet all types of crash test requirements. And that's, that's like one third of the effort. And then the final third is like fit and finish. You, you can't have a crappy car. I mean, Americans are not going to buy a $40,000 EV if the plastic doesn't, you know, fit. Because that's what they see. You know, they don't, they don't look under the hood. So I got a call uh, one night uh, from our guy in LA and he was like, hey, look, there's been a fire at the crash test facility in China and you need to get up there and figure out what happened. So 
I, I got my colleague James Lee and he and I jumped on an express train and we went up there. And there was like this little crowd of people outside the garage doors of the test facility. And, you know, the owner of the place let us in and kept everyone else out. And then we walked down this like dark, uh, you know, garage and we get to the car. And so this is one of those tests where the car is on a sled and gets slammed in sideways into a steel pole. So it's like wrapping the car around a telephone pole. Right. And and that's one of the standard, you know, uh, tests required by, uh, you know, U.S. transportation. So the car had been completely incinerated. And, and what we figured out had happened was that the floor of the car crumpled into the battery pack and basically shorted it out. So the battery pack became this enormous welding machine and started arcing. And, you know, the fire went up the air ducts, unfortunately, that were flammable into the uh, engine compartment and you got a hundred thousand dollar instrumented crash dummy sitting in the front seat and that guy was like burned to he looked like terminator in the first movie with like you know <laughs> with no skin <laughs> you know metal ribs and, and, and ruby eyes <laughs> so so you know the owner of the test thing he was like he's like look you got to get this car out of here because otherwise my employees are going to take pictures of it and put it on social media so we're like, we, we, we get it. You know, we get it. We got to get out of here. So we put the thing on a truck and put it under you know, a tarp and drove it off. And we found a body shop in like town. And so my Chinese colleague, you know, James, he was like, okay, guys, disappear the, the car body. You know, so they, they took all kinds of automatic saws and sledgehammers and things. And they just reduced the car itself to little bits and pieces. And then, you know, that went off to the landfill. And then we had this battery pack, and amazingly enough, the battery pack had had survived this major fire, and and for the most part was like seventy percent still alive. Wow! Uh, and we were like, well, you can't throw that in the landfill because that will actually hurt somebody. So we had to sit there, and you know, one by one, we had to take out about seven hundred cells, you know, just squatting on the dirt floor, and one by one, took out these like cigarette pack sized cells and put them into little plastic bags and threw them in the back of a pickup truck. But I, I was like, oh, my gosh, you know, this took me back to why I didn't want to be in manufacturing. <laughs> but anyway, so we exported cars to the United States. And, and, and Brock will tell you that some of those cars, these, are, these cars are called CODA, C-O-D-A. Some of these cars actually still exist. I mean, they're, they're, you know, they're about to be collector's items. But uh, it was a nice little car. It was, you know, it was non-sexy. It sort of looked like a Nissan, you know, Versa. So that was another problem is that, you know, Tesla started making a really kick-ass, sexy-looking car, and we had something that, you know, nobody wanted to spend $35,000 on it. Uh, so from that, you know, I then uh, the last thing I did in China, and, and this, again, is like the reinventing yourself story. So this is a, this is a funny story for your audience. And then and I woke up and I went, I went to a friend of mine, and he was now at a headhunting firm in Beijing. And I, you know, I asked him, I was like, Gavin, what does a foreigner do in China? And he said, nothing, you know, you're done. You know, there are no more opportunities for people like you. And he goes, you know, in fact, we don't even try to recruit Stanford educated Chinese guys. He's like, we just care about local Chinese who have personal relationships to like the politicians who matter. And I mean, that was brutal because I mean, really what that meant is all they really wanted to do was find some guy whose cousin, you know, was in government and, you know, could give him special favors. So I thought to myself, oh my gosh, now what am I going to do? And it dawned on me that, you know, the Swiss are really good at watches and the Americans are really good at airplanes and jet engines. And so I thought, okay, what can I do in that sector? And I saw on the internet that Citibank was offering this air finance course down in Hong Kong for like three days. And so, you know, air finance is basically, it's all of the, uh, you know, the, the finance related stuff that one would learn in terms of buying airplanes, and selling airplanes and leasing airplanes. And so it's, it's, you know, it's all about asset management. So I went down there, you know, put my business suit on and I was already, over 50 and I went down there and everybody in the class, except for one guy was like a young, you know, Hong Kong Chinese guy, you know, in their twenties working for like standard and chartered and HSBC. And I was like, this is not going to work. You know, 
they're not going to hire somebody like me at my age. And I was also like, I don't really, I don't really want to do air finance. Um, and so there was this other guy who was about my age, this Frenchman named uh, Laurent Abuse. I, I abuse the, uh, unfortunately, the pronunciation of it. But Laurent had this amazing business that he told me about where he was sitting in Europe and he was buying old A320, you know, narrow body airplanes. And the way he would do it is he would go to friends and others and he would raise money and then they would buy these planes. And they were like, you know, 15 years old to 25 years old. And then they would fly them, you know, to a place where they could disassemble them and then they would sell all the parts. You know, as long as the cash proceeds on the parts was higher than the purchase price of the plane, you know, it was the high-end junkyard business. And I was like, Lorenz, that is genius. You know, that is a business that I could do myself and I don't have to be hired for it. So I went back to Beijing and I, 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 you know, I studied the hell out of the China market. And China, you know, has the largest commercial aircraft fleet in the world outside of the United States. So I was like, you know, for sure they got to be, you know, uh, retiring something. Uh, and so I, I created this business plan and I went to America. And I, and I went to some people who were involved in this level of, you know, air finance. Uh, so guys in San Francisco and guys in New York. And they were like, you know, yeah, this is a great idea. But they were like, you know, the problem is, you know, you don't have any pedigree. So again, you know, here's the problem is that the classic thing is you haven't done this before. But the guys in New York, they go, have you heard about this guy, Abdul? Abdul done in Fort Lauderdale. I was like, no, what does Abdul do? And it turns out that Abdul runs a company called G8 Telesis. And G8 Telesis does exactly, you know, what I described. They go out and they buy mid to end of life airplanes and jet engines and they tear them apart and they sell the parts. And Abdul had just signed a joint venture with Air China to do this business in China. So I was like, oh my God. You know, so I contacted <laughs> Abdul and I'm like, Abdul, I'm your man. You know, I, I, I'm like, you've got your traders and I don't know anything about trading. But I, I'm the guy who can put together the JV. You know, I, I, I can hire all the people. I can, you know, I can implement all the processes because I've done that. You know, that's yeah. my shtick is like I set up businesses in China, and you put your, you know, your your trader guys in there, and and you can make it happen. And so that's what we did. So so uh, you know, I went and I, I interviewed with Air China, um, and uh, the woman who was running the fleet management program. You know, ended up you know being their kind of their counterpart to Abdul. Uh, so we had an interview in Chinese, and she was like, "Yeah, okay, you, you know, you're the guy." And so we had uh, the trading side was done by you know, Abdul's like trusted lieutenant who came out from Fort Lauderdale, uh, and we bought two 747s and a bunch of jet engines. And the 747s, we literally cut them apart at Beijing Airport. You know, took the engines off, shipped them back to America, uh, at least some of them, tore some of them down. Uh, we took all the sellable components off of one of them. And then, you know, we sold the airframe. We sold this empty Hulk to the Beijing security organization at Beijing Airport so they could do like, you know, anti-terrorist training on an on a empty plane sitting on the ground. And then we sold the other one to a guy, a Chinese entrepreneur who wanted to create this really cool restaurant based inside of a step <laughs> <laughs> So, so he ended up with an empty plate, you know, you know, that became a restaurant. Um, and 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 so that was a lot of fun. Uh, you know, there were issues that there were there were, let's say, uh, regulatory issues and some other things that we bumped into. So one of the big problems we we got into is that you know when you buy airplanes in China. Uh, you come in and you offer them and you say, okay, you got this 25 year old 737, you know, I'll give you, you know, $2 million for it. And the Chinese are like, oh crap, the book value, you know, on the balance sheet is like $5 million. And, and none of the management wants to take responsibility for a write down by selling it to us at 2 million. And, you know, so we tried everything in the book, you know, we tried to link up with leasing companies where, you know, the, the, the game would be the leasing company would buy at the inflated price, sell to us at the low, at the market, fair market, but then they would lease a more expensive plane at an inflated lease rate back into the airline, you know, so everybody looked like everybody was, you know, met their objectives. 
But, you know, to make a long story short, I got to a point where I was like, okay, I'm done with that. You know, the kids are growing up. The kids want to go to college, you know, and, and Shannon and I could see that, you know, it was be diminishing returns. Shannon had a really long and, and fruitful career in a part of the World Bank called International Finance Corporation. Um, you know, so Shannon had the real job. I had the roller coaster ride, you know, called Risky <laughs> Business. <laughs> but so we ended up, uh, we ended up making a decision to leave the country. And, you know, part of that decision was the following, which was that um, there were, there was like diminishing returns on the lifestyle. And, you know, this, China had become a mature, you know, much more mature grown up country. Um, so obviously, you know, traffic was really bad. Many more people had cars. You know, there were now hundreds and millions of cars on the road. The pollution was really bad. And in 2013, there, they had this event called an air apocalypse, which was just a total wipeout of the of the atmosphere. You know, where you'd be driving in downtown Beijing and you couldn't see more than like you know 50 feet in front of a car. Uh, and so, you know, what was the effect of that? It was probably like smoking three packs of cigarettes a day. Um, so that was bad. That, and that was worrisome. And then the last was, um, you know, the internet started to become restricted. And I don't know if you know this, but I mean, today, like, if you go to China, you can't, you can't get on Google, you can't see YouTube, you can't see Facebook, you can't see any of the, you know, the social media, you can't see the New York Times, you know, you, a lot of Western media, you just can't access it. And so, you know, that was a drag. You know, I was like, okay, you know, here, do I really want to be, you know, doing that? So uh, we ended up, we left China. Uh, we came back to the United States. And, you know, so what do you do when, you know, here you've spent your whole career in China. So in my case, I decided that I was going to do a follow-on to this aircraft salvage business, you know, this high-end junkyard business. And in China, I was running a team of, of salespeople who were, you know, talking to the airlines and they would quote the airlines and use parts. And, and, you know, the used part business is a big black box, you know, sellers, they know everything and buyers know nothing. Um, and so, you, you know, you're selling used parts for like $20,000 a pop or whatever. So I got to America and I was like, you know what, I think I'm going to try to disrupt that. I'm going to come up with like a price discovery site for used parts in the aviation world. And so I went down to San Jose, and and uh, you know how the Bay Area has these like um, coding boot camps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so I hired kids out of a coding boot camp, and it was it worked really really well. I mean, they were really cheap. They were still students there, but you know they basically they knew what they were doing, and and so they developed through this agile you know development process this really cool you know platform. And, you know, every week I would go with them and we would develop a new feature and this and that, and, and it worked really well. And then, you know, I went out and I personally went to United and American and Delta and, and you know, Southwest, and the cargo guys like FedEx and UPS. And the top guys would always be like, oh, yeah, this is really cool. A price discovery site, you know, this will give our buyers some leverage. And then you go to the buyers, the people who actually were supposed to use the system. And they're like, nah, nah, this is garbage. And the real reason is because they all had personal relationships to the sell side. And, you know, the sell side was like taking them out for steak dinners, <laughs> taking them to golf. <laughs> you know? So just like China, you know, personal relationships basically got in the way. And so I did that for about two years. And my wife was like, okay, you know, you put enough of your personal money into this. Like it's time to move on. So I then I created a company called... Uh, China Aviation Partners. And so what I do now, Phil, is I, I, I do a couple things uh, related to China. Um, one is I, I work with a company out of Dallas called Aero Exchange. And Aero Exchange is owned by airlines. It's a, it's a software company that's owned by major airlines around the world. And what it does is it helps the airline to connect their ERP system. You know, so it might be SAP helps them connect directly to their supplier networks like Honeywell and Collins. And so through a single point of connection, you know, you can, you can connect to everybody you buy from. So like American Airlines, you know, buys most of their stuff through this connection. And then the second thing is uh, they developed a, a marketplace to buy and sell, you know, high priced assets. So uh, think of aircraft engines are like houses in Atherton, California. 
you know, they're, they're like anywhere from, you know, 10 million to 15 million. Uh, and, and so, uh, we created this marketplace, uh, and, you know, because of my experience back in the days of GA Telesis, you know, I was able to bring in a lot of asset traders to list their product and buy and stuff on the platform. So, uh, I work with Chinese airlines and last September, I actually went, uh, on behalf of Air Exchange and met with a bunch of Chinese airlines. And so the Chinese airlines are also, you know, users of the system. So that's one thing. The second thing I do is, um, the there's an education issue for you know Chinese pilots. So think as you know as the Chinese commercial fleet grows, one of the inputs is you still need to have a lot of people learn how to fly. You know you need pilots, and the challenge is that you know China doesn't really have the open airspace or the flight school resource that we do in America. You know, Donna and I were laughing about this. Donna actually apparently has her pilot's license. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, so in America, you know, the airspace is wide open. If you want to jump in your Cessna and fly anywhere, you're basically, you can do that. Uh, and so America, as you can imagine, has all kinds of people who basically operate flight schools. And so pre-COVID, the Chinese were sending about half of their annual intake of student pilots to get trained in like, Texas and Arizona and Florida, it was a really good deal. You know, so airlines in China paid these flight schools to, you know, train their kids. And it's like a 12 month program. So COVID killed all that. You know, all the Chinese went home and, you know, every, all the contracts expired. And so that's a business that I'm very interested to, to get into. So I'm, I'm, I'm you know, working with flight schools here in the Bay Area uh, and then also in Texas. Uh, to develop a pipeline, a new pipeline of you know young people out of China, um, and then the last thing I do is, uh, as you can imagine, you know, the Chinese want to develop their own you know airplane and jet engine. So I work with a company in China to develop what's called a flying test bed. So it's an aircraft that can uh, help test their own aircraft engine. You know, so it's a it's a big airplane like a seven forty seven that you can big, take one engine off and you can put their engine in that location. Um, and then you can fly it up to, you know, test altitudes and speeds. So I, I, I do those things. And um, I continue to, you know, be in touch with Chinese. You know, I get on WeChat periodically and I talk to, you know, Chinese uh, clients over there. And I talk to my Chinese friends. You know, Donna asked me uh, the other day, she's like, well, you know, what type of media do you stay in touch with? And I said, well, you know, if it comes to really sort of sensitive issues about China, and I really want to understand what's going on. I, you know, I often I contact my old friends, um, and I ask them directly. Is like, you know, what is your group? What's their view on like, you know, is the housing market going to tank? You know, should you sell your apartment? Uh, or you know, I just ask them about uh, various things. You know, because sometimes with the Western media, it's hard to tell. You know, like right now we're we're in a period where Western media is super negative about a lot of what's going on in China, and 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 you can't tell if that's like representative of the real thing or not. I I you know I preface by saying I think unfortunately you know when I talk to the China experts, uh, the message is it might even be worse than how it's described. Uh, you know that that the, the biggest problem Phil is that people in China who own apartments, you know, and they've got a lot of their wealth tied up in an apartment. As the value of the apartment sinks, you know, they're they're losing confidence. Um, you know, that's like the worst thing that can happen. So, uh, I, I I do pay I do pay attention to some Western media, um, and then you know there's very various, various types of social media I listen to. Um, one thing that concerns me about the negative spin on China is American young people is that, you know, we turn now to what are the opportunities? It's sort of shocking that a lot of Americans don't realize a couple of facts, you know, so most people know that Apple makes all of their stuff in China. Um, you know, that's, that, that's pretty common knowledge. And, you know, the funny thing is if you go down at nighttime to the San Francisco airport and you jump on a United flight to Shanghai, <laughs> There are all these young people with backpacks. And if you ask them, what do you do? They won't tell you. But a lot of them are on their way to the Apple factory, you know, the Foxconn factory in China to implement, you know, the production of some new device or something. So there are a lot of tech people who are, you know, flying back and forth. And 
One of the ones that people don't realize is that Tesla makes more electric vehicles in China for the China market than it makes here in the United States. So you've got you know, young American engineers who work for Tesla who also jump on an airplane and go over there and, and you know, go to the Tesla factory to, to you know, help them develop new processes. So the point I'm making is that for young people, there's, there, there are a lot of opportunities to expose yourself with China and not, you know, not worry that uh, you're making a commitment that you, know, you don't necessarily want to have long term. But there are a lot of U.S. companies that still have these you know, outsourcing relationships to China where you can go as a representative of the U.S. company and really learn quite a lot about um, things like production, you know, things like deal making, you know, all that stuff. And conversely, you know, we look at Chinese companies. Um, so let's take the electric vehicle world. Uh, you know, you've probably seen news items that, you know, China's killing it with electric vehicles and, you know, the China market has a ton of them. They're pretty sexy. You know, not only are they like uh, great batteries and low cost batteries, but they've got amazing, you know, user interfaces, amazing, you know, electronics. And that's partly due to the fact that, you know, China has a big consumer electronics industry and they, you know, programming wise, they know what they're doing. But I think what's going to happen with the electric vehicles relative to the U.S. So, you know, we don't see these cars in America because, you know, the tariffs are very high on importing them. So I think we're going to see a time where China starts to localize production of EVs in Ohio and Alabama and South Carolina. I mean, same thing as what Toyota did and Honda did, and I believe the Koreans do it as well. I think Hyundai and, and you know, Kia do it as well. So, you know, Let's not be frightened of that. You know, let's basically accept that for what it is. And it will be a source of a lot of jobs. And, you know, when the Japanese did this like 30 years ago, the American brands responded. You know, GM and Ford and Chrysler eventually responded. And they, in the process, they learned quite a lot about how to make a higher quality car. So I think, you know, if the Chinese come and localize in America... For a young person, there's all kinds of opportunities to, you know, to be part of that, you know, to to join the Chinese company for a while. Uh, if they're gonna if they're gonna have you represent them in the United States, they might bring you back first to China and have you learn, like, at the head office, uh, how to, how to how's the place managed? You know, uh, how does this whole thing work? Where are they going? You know, what's their product development? And then they'll send you to the U.S. to basically have a leadership role for them. So, um, I think there are a lot of opportunities. I I have a big hope in the young in China and the young in America engaging with each other because I think that's a solution to some of our current problems is that, you know, look, logically the young in China are going to replace the existing leadership and the young in America will eventually replace our leadership here. And if they've been exposed to each other, you know, there's a lot of things that they will have a mutual understanding on. Uh, you know, so I, uh, you know, one of my deep desires coming out of, you know, risky business in China is that, uh, people do engage and, and like I say, I mean, there are many ways to engage where you don't have to commit the rest of your life to it, but there are many ways that you engage where, uh, you can get to know people there. You can get to know technology there. You can get to know, you know, how things are done. Um, and China is a very fun place. Uh, and by the way, I miss the food. I really, I, I really miss the food. I'm, 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 I'm sitting in Marin County, and, and the Chinese restaurants here are not as good. <laughs> yeah, you know, first of all, you are a phenomenal storyteller, and if what you shared here is <laughs> any indication of what it's like to read, uh, if I'm from correct here, I have risky business in rising China, right? If it's any indication of what it's like to read that book with far more in depth moments and details and just here's what I've gathered so far from hearing you share everything. Okay. Number one, you've proven just through anecdotes, the importance of understanding business internationally and how it's impacted, uh, you know, America and how, when you give the example of what happened with Japan at its peak in the bubble and how that may mm -hmm. correlate to what's occurring now, Right. It immediately evoked in me 
a sense of needing to understand not only the history of development for any country's ability to manufacture, right? So often in America, we, especially people who aren't in manufacturing, the bulk of what we know of manufacturing is, yeah, we used to have car companies, I think in Chicago. This is the general, right. the general <laughs> feeling, not even fact or knowing of anything. It's just the general feeling. As you know, Americans feel a lot of things, right? And so that general feeling when backed by a story like this gives tremendous perspective to how important it actually is to understand that and whether it's growing or not and mm -hmm. what will replace that in, in terms of what young people can get involved in. And so then you offering a bridge and saying, look, this is a perfect opportunity for international relations, right? Especially as Americans who can then represent those companies and then yes. essentially bring back a degree of manufacturing here in the U.S., even if not run by U.S. corporations, right? Uh, so there's that bar that's building as, as I hear what you share. And then, you know, I recently got a chance to see some things that Malay had said at uh, the, the, the World Economic Forum. And he talks about the, the idea of how state running the operations and companies and what that leads to. There's a lot of coercion behind that. And then you hear the stories that there, there are very few examples, far few and in between. You actually have to dig deep to find ever something state run be done in a way where it wasn't a little sticky in some ends. And, <laughs> and the illustrations you provided sort of give that. Uh, you yeah. can see how it impeded commercial success and, and, and general abundance no matter where it was. And it's not to say that it can't work. It's to say that the way it's usually done often leads to the opportunities to make it a sticky situation that impedes progress mm -hmm. more than actually offers it, right? So you get these things here, these, disc these discourses happening. And then across the board, you show the entrepreneurial spirit of constantly running into an obstacle where most would have given up, you thinking, okay, what am I going to do? And I don't know if it was like that while you were sharing the story, you, you could laugh about it. But I imagine at the time when you're finding out that you're running this operation and someone is literally 100% packing all that gear, shipping it off somewhere way further south, throwing their own stamp on it, which is, you know, <laughs> making it a legitimate product. And you find out how much money was lost behind that and you're involved in that. I can't imagine that was a nice feeling. And while you can laugh about it now, for some people, that's the end, right? And sure, yes. you... You pivoted yeah. and you shifted and you went into other industries, but always in one way or another, whether it was because it was your expertise or not, you ended up being at the, at the helm of emerging technologies, right? And, and whether yeah. it was the automotive boom and what was happening there, but still heavy manufacturing, heavy industry, right? Like just, just heavy on emerging technology to then moving into the cellular space and, and, and watching that grow. And as somebody who wasn't, a part of that experience, but having interviewed enough entrepreneurs and most of them focused on software, right? I have mm -hmm. only my experience uh, working once uh, for, I want to say maybe about the better half of a year with a Korean company that was coming into the US. I was fractional doing fractional marketing for them. And uh, mm -hmm. they had developed an AI controller to help uh, earthwork machines uh, due to the lack of labor force as that force is aging and there aren't enough young people in construction, right? So I start pulling these parallels of what you're sharing in terms of uh, the the general manufacturing and, and the development of China and, and how they're coming to the U.S. Or, or have intentions of doing that and you bridging that gap, you know, with, uh, with your expertise, experience and connections and relationships. And I start to see something that I didn't see before about how important it is to work and think internationally in terms of business now, more than ever before. Yes. Because as emerging yeah. technologies have shown through the illustration of your story, AI is coming here, right? And we didn't even get a chance to talk about this. And this will disrupt a lot of things, but it's also yeah. only going to, it should serve to further compel us to find ways to bridge these gaps because Borders are going to be a thing of the past. And I'm not saying to have open borders. I don't want anybody to misinterpret <laughs> what I'm saying. What I'm saying is in terms of business, commerce, and developing abundance in the world as entrepreneurs do, as they are known to be the heroes of that, right? Uh, capitalism in its purest sense, not necessarily with all the political baggage, but truly 
opening up the world, I, I become inspired through your story to consider where can I become involved in international business? And, you know, then you think about, you know, universities and what are they doing to provide those opportunities instead of just shelling out degrees, right? And so yeah. each one of these things could be a podcast, a book, an episode in and of itself. And yet the heart and the spirit of that inspiration and that that stance, that path that lies before us can be found in your book. And so mm-hmm. for me, it's just inspired me to want to meet someone like you who worked out of Japan, someone like you who worked out of Germany, someone like you who's worked out of Russia. You see what I'm saying? And getting those yeah. stories to really aggregate and show the importance of less of a one world government. And, and not that I'm yes. against it or for it, I'm just saying, and more of a global trade that everyone can be a part of from the the worker in a factory for the places that still have factories, right? And like understanding just how their role plays into all of this. Mm -hmm. When you have that kind of perspective, right, on that high level, granted, you know, living living conditions have to be well enough that someone can abstract on that level as opposed to, you know, I've got rice and potatoes, you know, like that's all I'm thinking about. And that's its own conversation. (laughs) But the implications of what you've shared and the places we can go intellectually and, and, and economically, I think all of that lives in the spirit of your book. And I just wanted to give you that as a response to all that you shared with me, because while this episode is running longer than it usually does uh, on the show, Mm -hmm. it's such an important conversation for what's about to happen because of the relationships as you, as you've, as you've outlined here between the U S and China. And you're right. Like for me to sign up to WeChat, I actually have to know someone who's already a part of WeChat. So right. they immediately stop there and I can know nothing other than whatever bits and pieces come through. And so there's this digital firewall, if you will, right? That's too hot to touch to ever get across unless someone pulls over from the other side first. And what I love about what you shared is you were there, you lived it, and you brought a lot of that back with you to this conversation here to help us understand the implications mm-hmm. of that for those of us who aren't privy to international business. And so what a service this conversation has been. The book, by the way, is in both paperback and Kindle versions. Uh, so it's available on Amazon. Uh, and then if people want to contact me by email, so my email simply, it's, it's actually written in the front of the book, is markriskybusiness at gmail.com. Uh, and then I also encourage people, if you want to connect to me on LinkedIn, uh, please, please do that. Uh, and you know, I'm interested to, uh, to share with people, you know, offline if they want to learn more. Uh, I'm hundred percent confident. Uh, anyone who gets to this point in this recording is absolutely interested in knowing more and totally qualified to send you an email because this is just <laughs> one of those conversations that needs to be recorded, needs to be told. and you've done that in your book and you happen to augment and supplement that here through the conversation today. So thank you, Mark, for everything. Yeah. And thank you, Phil.